Welcome to the Ninja Tune Podcast, where this week we sit down with Diswoman members Um Fung and Frankie DeCaser Hutchinson. They give us a rundown on how they got started in New York, some of the nights they're involved with, and their fight against New York's outdated cabaret law. We hear about some of the artists that inspire them at the moment, and also some of the music they listened to growing up. After that, we check out some of the new releases coming out on the Ninja Tune family of labels, with tracks from Era, Sampa the Great, Nabia Iqbal, Helena Half and Project Pablo. Don't forget, if you're listening in iTunes, please rate and review the Ninja Tune podcast. Fun. Um, I DJ and make music, and I'm a co founder of Disc Woman. And I'm here with Frankie DeGaza Hutchinson. I'm also one of the co founders of Disc Woman, too, along with Christine, who's not with us. Yes. So, Disc Woman uh, started. A few months after Frankie and I became friends, um, we spent a lot of time together hanging out at Boston Nova Civic Club, which was, which is a a great community resource where um, it's a techno club and it's really small and um, it's basically just full of residencies. So uh, it has a pretty tight community of people that. We see the same people all the time, and um, we were both regulars there. And we noted that there were so many uh, talented female DJs playing at Bossa Nova, and we had met so many people just from a few years of living in New York. Um, So that kind of gave us the idea. We were were like, oh, let's do like a mini festival showcasing all these people, because it's kind of incredible how many that we know. Um, So it really came from a positive place, us just wanting to showcase that. Um, And then we brought on Christine, who is just a wizard at event production. Um, And really ever since, like, we all met and kind of started concepting that first thing, we've been, the three of us, just doing it. Um, And we got a lot of good press right away, and it just kind of, like kept going and going and going and now we're here <laughs> pretty much <laughs> yeah, yeah but it's, I think it's definitely like progressed into being way more politicized and it's politicized me like a lot more too and I mean it's become <laughs> more like warfare in a way like I don't know I don't know it's crazy like I feel like I don't it's like we're in combat and but it's like it, it, but it's awesome like it's, weird, like it's like a bunch of, of a community of very like-minded people and we want to see progress and change like and it's like that simple yeah i think like yeah it's a like from where we started i feel like it was like part denial and part like a lack of awareness that i didn't really realize we were entering such a tense zone and now that we kind of opened that door and we feel like we have a credible voice it's like not only do we like see what needs to change but we also have to say something (laughs) and that sort of social responsibility is now our burden and our our pleasure pleasure, (laughs) (laughs) it's an interesting place to be it's like it's like we can't really rewind out of that like position of authority um but also none of us would really want to because now we see that we're affecting an infrastructure and that's really powerful Thank you. 
What music do you remember connecting to as a young person? I feel like this is something we don't talk about that much because we're so fixated on like what we do together now. Um, and I think it's interesting to sort of go back in time, like to your point of reference and what like maybe started your connection with what you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, growing up, my mum was a single mum, so we didn't really have much money. We had like only a few CDs. And the CDs that she had were Mary J. Blige, TLC, like Tony Braxton. I think like a weird like Kenny G album or something, mm-hmm. which I just never listened awesome. to. Yeah. <laughs> but from an early age definitely like connected with R and B music mm-hmm. and I would have those those CDs on repeat and repeat, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. and Mary J in particular, like her own struggles, she's so vulnerable in her music and I think as like a young black woman it was really like I don't know, I really connected with it in a deep way. How about you? I feel like it's like cheating when I like have this question thrown at me or something because I have such um, unconventional parents. So I remember hating most of what they listened to because my dad listened to a lot of classical music. And um, but what I did like that I remember was a Brian Eno tape that. I called the man singing tape because I thought that most musicians were women for some reason. I think I think I had been exposed to like we lived in kind of like a hippie town like in Ithaca, New York. So I feel like I had been exposed to like women folk singers or something like I don't know what I just like I remember being like so annoyed at like the music that I was exposed to but I liked the specific tape right okay yeah i don't know that's like but but it's like crazy because then i come to like learn that that's actually like a really respected electronic musician right, right but as a kid it was like more like pop music and i think it just seemed like playful and like fun right. and not folk music which i like hated the passage of time is flicking dimly up on the screen I can't see the lines I used to think I could read between Perhaps my brains have turned to sand Oh me oh my I think it's been an eternity surprised at my degree of uncertainty funny like thinking what you said about classical music and stuff I remember at school like classical music being like a little bit embarrassing or like kind of uh, what's the word? irrelevant and disconnected from youth like in a way totally, do you know what yeah. I mean like totally. so it was like not cool to like that thing no. at all and now it's like I'm like bring it on right. <laughs> yeah seriously yeah <laughs> yeah it's kind of weird it um. is really weird for me, I definitely, it started, I had this really big crush on this guy, and he, like, so I, like, just copied everything that he did, but then <laughs> I, I copied his taste, too, but then his tastes were really good, and he introduced me to, like, a lot of music, and one of, you know, some of it was um, Aphex Twin and, like, Square Pusher, and it really broadened my horizons, you know, going from, like, listening to, like, three CDs and then having, um 
mostly be listening to a lot of pop music um, and then hearing that I was like wow like you know music can be really expansive and weird and that led me into listening to Bjork and that kind of little sort of train and then there that was how I, but at that time it was only listening music to me and then experiencing it as a raver is like a whole nother how story. How old were you when like you heard Aphex Twin. Do you know? Uh, probably like 16 or 17. Okay. And oh. the first song was that I fell in love with was Flim by Aphex Twin. Okay, cool. <laughs> Like I had, uh, well, I guess when I was like maybe 11 or so, and I, I was really into like listening to the radio, and I had like a clock radio, and there was like um, a there was like late night radio from Kansas City that I could get, like from the town I lived in that was near Kansas City, um, that was like sort of like trance and dance music like on Friday nights or something but like that culture seemed so far away from my reality I thought it was sort of like this like silly thing that like only existed in like some made up right. culture or right, something right, right, right. like like I was really into the Spice Girls when I was a kid and like Same. I knew about that kind of context of like party like party girl mm. raver right, sort of but like right. it, I didn't know that, that like that could be like anywhere close to my reality ever <laughs> right. I guess so uh, yeah so it's like I remember being into that um, I remember writing down the track name for DJ Fanny Heaven do you remember I that, know that track no it's like um <laughs> I'm not gonna sing on a podcast. Come on, see how it goes. You did karaoke a couple like, days ago, right? Like, uh, baby, it's hard to believe when you love. Oh, I love that song. It's it's called it's a person called DJ Fanny. Yeah. Oh my god, that's such a good DJ. No? But like that song, like that sort of like euphoric oh, trance, yeah, yeah, like. Yeah. I was I love yeah, that. Or like totally. there was a Janet there was a Janet Jackson song and a Whitney Houston yeah. song that were on the radio when yeah. I was a kid and I remember like also not really having access to that or not knowing yeah. how to access it other than from the radio yeah. but being like obsessed when it would come on and like I knew all the words and I was like but they are like dance tracks yeah. like for sure. But I didn't like identify with that. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I think when I was in college I happened to fall in with people that were like DJing casually or into electronic music and it felt more normalized. Yeah, for sure. Um, and maybe in high school too I had some exposure but like not like a close identity with it. Yeah, it was, there was loads of those pop tracks like that. They were probably like just ripped off of like actual like trance music that was yeah. cool and underground and sure, there's all these totally. raves happening when we were like 12 that we didn't yeah. know about but we got like the pop version of it. Mm. <laughs> totally. That's, that, that song's a banger. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's so great. good. Um, yeah, I guess like even things like Daft Punk were more in the uh, yeah, mainstream 
and I it's like there is sort of a, a human component to connecting to like um, cheesy drops and stuff and I feel yeah. like so when you're like in I don't know when you're like 11 you're like kind of into it yeah. in a way maybe well I feel like you also like you like incorporate that humor into your DJing too though I guess so. Yeah, well, I mean. yeah, totally. Because it is really innocent in a way. Like, yeah, it's funny. I still just probably would want to like play DJ Fanny. <laughs> <laughs> really, <laughs> I'm really waiting for that. <laughs> um, I cannot. Well, so oh, good. oh, and that brings that brings me to Madonna, Ray of Light. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect. <laughs> Which is one of the um, mm-hmm. things I wanted to talk about because. Again, like, it's interesting to hear you saying that your mother only had a few CDs, and I feel like that was completely my reality as well, where I had, like, my, like, five CDs or something. And I remember, like, I remember someone said something on Twitter a while ago about how, like, uh, how how funny it is to have, like, CDs or, like, a car with a few CDs because you end up listening to music that you hate and memorizing it. (laughs) <laughs> you know <laughs> and like so it's like just whatever you have access to but it's like someone gave me Madonna Ray of Light I don't know who it was probably like a, someone who I didn't really relate to like a relative not knowing what to get me for Christmas or something right, right, right. but then it's like I listened to it constantly because I had like a walk CD Walkman yeah. and I would like <laughs> did you have a disc one? I don't know <laughs> Uh, mega bass <laughs> yeah um <laughs> anyway but uh and that album which i've recently revisited because it i found out it's by this like really significant producer william orbit from the uk um that album is like incredible like now that i'm listening to it at from like a producer standpoint i'm just like this thing is a masterpiece it's mind-blowing and like all of these tracks are just like insane and i remember as a kid i connected with them because they're just like pop and like fun and weird and that that album is so 90s like all of the imagery is like candy and clubbing and like there's like yeah there's like the song like candy perfume girl and like uh like there's all these like like skin the one that's like it's just like about being in a club and like right what is frozen on that album too. yeah oh, that's such a good song right Going back and watching those music videos a few months ago was so depressing for me because it's like literally each video is her appropriating someone else to an, to a degree that's like unimaginable. Like at this at this point in time, like no one would get away with that. But that's right. always what right, right. she's done. done. Right. Anyway, um, but it's like she she yeah she sucks. But my mom always said didn't like her. Yeah. And then I was just like, I'm done. But then Frozen came out and I was like, okay, just kidding. I like her for a minute. Yeah, but yeah, we we wanted to address like that happens so much in especially like also tied in with like what we listen to in our daily lives now and like how we both are like obsessed with the rap music on the radio now. And like just like whenever you encounter this sort of dichotomy of like, okay, I love this song. I but I hate this person yeah. or I hate these lyrics or I hate like how she's getting away with this or I hate how he's getting away with this or you know whatever like right exactly um, I mean, and I, I, sorry, cool. well no I guess we've I think we've talked before about how yeah. like sometimes you just kind of have to like not be so hard on yourself like Absolutely. and just enjoy it but I it's mean yeah tough. I was say you know like like I mentioned to you before like earlier in the week like 
but on sound there was a talk about um, based around a book on like loving music that hates you and I just thought it was a really interesting like theme and topic because I love music that hates me like I love <laughs> you know like um, and I don't want to just put it into like rap music but that is yeah. the music that I listen to the most and um, you know obviously is a misogynist <laughs> lyric or two sometimes um, but um, but one of the interesting things that came up and like you were saying it's like do you is it is it our responsibility to feel bad about that like should we be like conscious like listeners in that way like is it our fault that uh, these men are misogynistic in their music or these women or whoever is uh, culturally appropriating or and we're still like consuming it like I don't know. It's and it was inconclusive, and uh, and I think it is. It's just a, it's something really weird to navigate, really. Yeah, okay. even like uh, talking about like in DJ sets, if I'm preaching one thing and then including most of this music that I idolized that was made in like the '90s by white men, mm-hmm. like what is that really saying about like right. my progressive angle right, it's not right, it doesn't right, right. feel right you right, know right, right, and uh, like we were talking to um, Lisa non-compliant the other day and she was saying the same thing like damn it I just made a whole mix with all these men and like I didn't even notice you know and it's like uh, but I really struggle with that because I feel like it's the same thing where it's like yeah I try and find stuff I connect with in a really genuine way and I am sad if yeah absolutely if i like hate yeah. what i'm connecting with absolutely. or like uh i just recently found out that one of my favorite producers uh who has a latin name is actually a white german using a latin name like a fake name and it bummed me out so much because i was like i love this producer duo yeah. so much and it's so sick that like I finally found something like off of the course and it's just not. It's not. And I felt yeah. so like betrayed. Like let down. Yeah. It's a let down. It's also like, um, like why did you have to do that? Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, that's like a really big thing in like, uh, in electronic music. Yeah. Historically is like Europeans kind of taking on names they think sound not white. <laughs> totally. Which is... A whole <sighs> yeah. other podcast. Oh, I mean, no, no, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we could just get into DJ yeah. gossip in that um, way. Right. <laughs> um, fall down that road. Well, let's like switch gears a little bit and talk about um, what music or producers are inspiring to us right now. Um, people that we know or people that we've come in contact with in whatever way um, because I think there are a lot of like cool great voices coming up absolutely um, like for me I'd mentioned Bergsonist and Valentina as like super inspiring to me I don't know there's so many but there, like, there's so many and, uh, you know I think it's interesting as well like I could name like a million names, but I think the context in which we're in is totally what I find to be the most like beautiful thing about it is that like, I don't know, there's just so many of us. I mean, I'm not a producer by the way, but <laughs> um, but of, of, like, you know, young women and LGBTQ artists making such amazing like sounds. I don't know like what is going on, but in the last like, few years it's been a I don't know know, a big shift in sort of like um, people feeling comfortable making it and the sounds coming out are just so insane
spend a lot of time thinking about how like um, this could be me just being a, like glorifying things but like I feel like it's interesting that so much electronic music comes from the Midwest and from working class where like you actually do sit at your job all day and then you go mm-hmm. home and you want that kind of like outlet whereas I feel like since I've transitioned into more of a freelance lifestyle it might actually be harder for me to access that. Like when I worked a boring job, I would think all day about like how excited I was to get that moment. Whereas now it's like my responsibility to structure that into like an already sort of like ambiently flowing schedule. And sometimes I think it's like almost harder to assert that time when you have a lot going on. Mm But I mean, I, I think see, you can I see, see it both like, ways for yeah, sure because it's definitely both ways. Yeah. yeah, but like sometimes I think like, oh, maybe if I just had a regular job again, <laughs> I would have yeah. like more peace of mind to like have that focus when I get home from work or when I have that day off. Right, right. That means so much. Um, I don't know, because yeah, it's like so many of like our heroes in Detroit like worked industry jobs and yeah then had a home studio yeah, and like studio. there's not a lot of distractions maybe in like a less um, busy city uh, but yeah I don't know it's 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 tricky I think, and, yeah it's really tricky and also obviously like the other thing is like um, you know people uh, understanding that they can actually do it you know like that's a that's a whole nother thing it's like people they want the they need the tools or they need the encouragement and like um, I don't know that's a hard thing to I don't know it's tricky but yeah and I think like it can be hard when like if I'm say preaching that like you should do whatever you know fulfills you in your heart but then like I'm getting international recognition for doing that it kind of like lacks credibility in a way where it's like it's like sure it's easy for you to say because like you're getting recognized for doing that whereas like it's a lot harder to stick up for yourself when you're working at a grocery store and you're the only person you know that cares about electronics like or something you know it's like it's way harder to defend like if you don't have like sort of outside approval absolutely and we are like pretty spoiled in a way because we have such like cool community where we are i mean there are people who are like in sort of wherever in the us and they don't have that direct like community and support like like we can say things and we'll have like people to support us other people say things and they have no one around them and so there's no there's no like a uh, community of encouragement right. it's so much harder i think to i guess that's why the internet yeah. is so popular like even historically in like tech communities or something because i don't know like there's there's more of an access point to feel like you have support through some right. other network right. um because what you're doing might be outside of what's normal to society or something.
so we acknowledge how lucky we are that we've built this we each have very different roles but we have built careers out of a, a passion project essentially mm -hmm. um but one thing that we've also experienced heavily is that that means that we don't have any time mm -hmm. to ourselves um so what is something that you wish you had more time for in the context of your life right now because we talk a lot about how grateful we are about this but also like is there a way that you wish that that could restructure so you had more time that's such a nice question i would love time to lay on a beach in thailand and not have to look at my phone yeah <laughs> i mean i literally check my emails every five minutes so yeah. it's like pretty intense you know and if you know and if you don't check your email and <laughs> for like two hours and it's like vroom it's like a panic attack you know what i mean so it's like to not have that for a minute so would be ideal uh, <laughs> an auto reply and an assistant <laughs> an assistant I think would could be help. great <laughs> yeah maybe actually yeah <laughs> okay great well okay, then let's that, talk about the, that i think we just got you okay, like well, at least two days off, <laughs> so i can go to thailand now <laughs> yeah sick um but yeah I, th I don't know that's a really nice question actually what would what would i want to do um, read more would be really nice. Don't have any time to read books. Yeah. It's something that I once loved. <laughs> and it becomes so difficult when you uh, also... What about when sorry. you travel? Like, do you not want uh, to do it? No, it no, no, not, not, sometimes. I'm a little fidgety, though. Yeah. What do you do on an international flight if you don't have the internet? I usually just watch the movies and I watch like, like a little crappy film. I like watching those like rom com things, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I, I, I and that I love watching True. movies love I do love film I'd love to get back into that I really have big dreams of wanting to start a film review yeah. site big yeah. dreams I actually bought the domain yeah but I never <laughs> spill on it so I know what the name of it is okay well you'll have to share that at, a, at another date I guess yes exactly exactly <laughs> This year, a few people in our scene, uh, one of which is, is an owner of the bar that we you know, frequent, and a couple of other folks uh, kind of banded together wanting to repeal uh, New York City's cabaret law. And the cabaret law is a law that was introduced in 1926 as a kind of way to break up black Harlem jazz clubs and it prevents people from dancing without a license essentially is what it is and it's still on the books today so it's actually illegal to dance in New York City without this license only a um, hundred establishments have a cabaret license out of 20,000 so you know it just speaks to sort of how ridiculous in nature it is um, it's depending on the government sort of the mayor or the, that, the New, York, New York City and a government that's in place at the time like um, that kind of controls how it's used sometimes it's enforced sometimes it's not so the law has changed a lot over like the years um, but it was most sort of like heavily enforced in the 90s under Giuliani who was a wildly conservative mayor um, he shut down a bunch of LGBTQ bars uh, really like uh, stomping out like the club culture which you know is spaces for the city's most marginalised communities so 
It's been a tool used oppressively. Um, and, you know, some may argue now that, you know, it's not being used in the same way, but it really depends. Like, if there's a police officer who, you know, is racistly inclined and doesn't like a certain bar because there's a lot of Dominican people there, are black folks there, doesn't like hip-hop music, they can issue a citation on dancing and um, that bar and that small business is, uh, gets put there you know, whole livelihood gets put in jeopardy, basically. And those fines are so hefty for such a small business. It's so hard for small businesses to survive in New York because it's so expensive. So when they get these really heavy fines, I mean, it's like devastating. Um, but we are in a great place now. And we started this organization called the Dance Celebration Network, which is just a one issue um, organization. And um, it's come surprisingly far. We're at a point now where uh, uh, de Blasio, who is the current mayor of New York, um, has publicly backed um, the bill, which was put in place by uh, council member Rafael Espinal, um, to repeal the law, which is the first time it's ever been in this position. And so we're getting closer. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we're at with it, I think. Let New York City dance is our tag, you know. <laughs> I mean, we do anyway, but you know what I mean. It's got to go. And it's, it's, you know, it's also just like symbolic too. Do you know what I mean? Like, like go away. Like, what is it doing here? I'm so over it. And I'm, I'm, when I argue about it, I am pretty simple in the way that I do it because I just feel like having any law on the books that can be used arbitrarily and uh, used racistly and homophobically like should have no business in a city as particularly like New York which boasts such culture. I thought it was super interesting at the hearing I went to that um, there were a few people from like tango groups too because I feel like that's a big problem is that the government is thinking about like clubs and drugs or it's like that's how they play it off and then for like tango Mm -hmm. clubs to be like yo like this is like a traditional dance that you guys are supposed to be like down with like what's going on you know and it's like that makes it feel even more like i understand why people would want to shut down like dance clubs because like drugs are illegal and whatever blah 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 but like that I feel like really made totally. it seem like totally insane. You're like, that's so <laughs> And mean. like salsa clubs, and you know, it's like... Right, right, it's right. Like, but that's what? like the sort of, that's the sort of <laughs> irony of the city, isn't it? It's like, right. it's penalized, like, it's jazz musicians for right. years. They yeah. were treated like garbage. And now everyone is so highbrow about jazz. These black folks who were like pioneered the music and they were treated like terribly. And the New York government is using them in brochures you know right. what i mean like that's the irony it's like right. what it's are you like doing? go to harlem we're jazz yeah, what jazz yeah, is it's like, it's, full of it. it's like you treat them like <laughs> shit like you're joking it's like it's actually illegal it's actually yeah <laughs> it's actually illegal for me to go and jazz see jazz illegal, and so, yeah. yeah exactly yeah it's pretty it's yeah, insane it's yeah I think one of the best that left like a long time impact on me was, you know, when me and Emma went to Warsaw last year, we she played a, a party called Brutage, um, which is run by our friend Jacek. And uh, that was really powerful for us. I mean, we didn't I have no idea anything about Warsaw, but um, the party was, you know, this, I mean, you'd probably hate it to describe it this way, but like, and it's just this beautiful space within such a conservative like country to be really free 
or you know uh, attempts to create that and I've the energy is just like unlike any party I've been to and we did one we collabed uh, with them this year too and it was like amazing I mean people had like protest signs there it was just like pro-feminism like anti-racism it was just like really powerful and like that's definitely one of my favorite events that we've done um you know and one of the my favorite parties and i think that uh, that space is just one of the most important in techno right now honestly i would say that for sure you're like i'm just gonna say that one no i'm, no, I'm, I'm trying to I, I feel like i had a like an experience recently where i like actually danced a lot and now i like am blanking out on what that was we together? i don't i don't even know i like feel like i haven't even done anything last year yes. i mean it's like i feel like shy boys techno sets are really exciting to me right now that actually makes me dance now that this is like my job i feel like it's so rare that i get to like let loose like even a night like tonight or like I had a 3 to 6 a.m. set last night. I have a 3 to 6 a.m. set tonight and tomorrow. So it's like I have to sleep for most of the party in order to like sustain the kind of travel and movement. So like to actually get to like be there and be present and like dance all night is so rare. Um, but yeah, I got to go to my friend's underground party in Montreal after I played a branded event. And it was really refreshing to just like let loose in a super weird space like yeah actually just dance and like it's like i got my set over with and i just went to another party and like it was so fun so i think that's kind of what affects me is when we can like successfully find like a pocket of an underground scene pocket of freaks like us, yeah basically. exactly yeah. and just like and, <laughs> and just get to yeah. enjoy it like I, I really like value that so much. Absolutely. I have to be like so on point if I'm gonna DJ late at night yeah. and I feel so lucky to just get to like let loose. Definitely. Actually and like honestly, I know we just got back, but like Unsound really I found it exceptional an exceptional experience and it blew me away in a lot of ways I didn't think it was gonna happen because you always think you've seen every party or been to every event but like it, there was something about the synergy between sort of educational part of it and how it went into the night and like it didn't you didn't stop learning throughout the party like I like I just spoke to so many people last night and like the conversation just kept going and it was so unique like the way it carried out yeah, I don't like know it was this, amazing this stuff yeah like go over yeah from the day from the day of learning yeah. and like people still want to talk and yeah. while that can be exhausting it was like I don't know I can't, I feel like I've come back with like such crazy new perspectives and energy and like there's also it was so much like resilience and strength in the people that we met and interacted with that it was just like I don't know I'm still buzzing from it it was cool it was really really cool I, they've really cultivated it's something really special there yeah Oh, and also, um, sustained release was <laughs> unreal. Yeah. There were some magic moments there, for sure. It's hard to like pinpoint when that happens, because yeah. there's something about like the ethos of the people involved that you can't really like define.
I don't really throw parties. I hate throwing parties. I think it's almost impossible. <laughs> I mean, I I do the easy thing, which is having a resident night at a bar with a, an owner that is expecting one thing, which is techno. So it's like without that sort of formula like throwing underground parties is really hard <laughs> like it takes a lot of planning and like insider info um so i mean unless you're really in interested in collaborating to or help a project that's already going and then figuring out how to do it yourself like i mean i just say start small because like that's how my life was when i was in college like i had you know 20 friends that might have like house parties and that's way more attainable than like getting a party going <laughs> um, but like the logistics of actually like producing an event that's like magical and intimate and doesn't get shut down by the police and you know, it's like, it's like the it's most set. stressful thing on the planet like planning a Detroit party which actually also was like one Fantastic. of the most magical yeah. Wow, we've been to so many fun parties. Uh, it was really one of the most magical events too. And it, the way it even came together was just like insane. But uh, it was just like so stressful. Like the panic you get and like you're putting everything on the line and artists and it's just like you're responsible for so much that it's like, why am I doing this? And then as soon as the party's great, you're like, yes, I want to do it again. <laughs> you know, like, and now we're already planning the next one. I think it's like yeah. a form of addiction. It's, it's a like, kind of a, If you have yeah, a yeah. really great party and you make money, then like, you just want to do it again. Yeah, absolutely. But then when you get like shut down by the police and it's lose like, like several world. thousand dollars, it's just like, why was I ever even doing why this? Why would I do this? Why am I doing this with my life? <laughs> <laughs> it's so polarizing. Yeah. It's, ah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Get ready to be like emotional, I guess. If you yeah. Want to party. It's not easy. Definitely. Yeah. To be pretty resilient. For sure. for everyone on our roster yeah. to seeing everyone evolve is like really really exciting because also I'm not responsible for that <laughs> but it's awesome but yeah, like it's, it's great, great it's to see this, and everyone changes so quickly it's like, cool. I don't know it's like a little baby and it's really like I don't know also like on Sun Speak I was talking to a lot of agents and like that was really cool and like feeling like, oh wait, I'm like one of these people now, we kind of just made this up, and like, Emma's playing after Nina Kravitz, and we're like, our minds are blown, it's just like, well, I don't understand what's going on, yeah. but this is cool, and we want to keep it growing, and like, that's, you know, one of the biggest things for us is like, we need to create something that's sustainable outside of the hype of disc women. we want to have a business we want to get women paid and this is the way we can do it is by having an agency a structure you know like the hype will die down not everyone you know things move and they evolve but like i think if we can really sort of expand this like thing and have a lot more artists represented and hopefully like a bunch more agents too yeah. um that's really where i see the future of it yeah yeah because like we've been talking a lot about like as my career took off, then I can't participate in helping with this woman as well. And it's like us just dealing with the evolutions yeah. of like what yeah. we've created. Yeah. It's like we literally created our own problem in a way. It's like, yeah, exactly. It's like, oh damn, like I don't have time to make an album because I'm succeeding. Right, <laughs> you know, right, like, right, right, right. Oh, okay. Right, right. <laughs> so just sort of figuring out how to like restructure that right. so that we're all there for each other, but also like trying to follow like what's happening. It's just like a lot of. A adjustment I guess and like it's all exciting and it's yeah. happening to all of our artists where yeah. they're just getting busier and busier and it's awesome yeah absolutely <laughs> Thank you.
Our thanks to Umfang and Frankie DeGaza Hutchinson from Discwoman. Now we turn our attention to some of the new releases coming out on the Ninja Tune family of labels, starting with Era and a track called Reflection of Youth. That was Era, with a title track from her Reflection of Youth album, which is out on Big Dada. Next, it's Sampa the Great and a track called By River, taken from her forthcoming mixtape out in November. Always be short and third eye open, still in fortune, show exhaustion, river flow deep in solid motion, raised on seeds of mass proportion, going in a world of mass distortion, please keep you through trials fortune, through hella, five feet bella, one slick talking, black Cinderella, real fast walking, smooth shit, jazz shit, smile through rain and shame, who had a shit? By River by Sampa the Great on Big Dada. Now we have Nabiya Iqbal, formerly known as Throwing Shade, with something more from the forthcoming album, Weighing of the Heart, which is out in December.
That was Nabiya Iqbal with something more on Ninja Tune. Next, it's Gift by Helena Half from a brand new EP. Have you been there? Have you seen it? Helena Half with Gift from her new EP on Ninja Tune. Finally, it's Canadian producer Project Pablo with Oh For Sure out on his EP on Technicolor.
Project Pablo with a track from his EP, Hope You're Well, out on Technicolor. That's it for the Ninja Tune podcast. Our thanks to Umfang and Frankie DeCaser Hutchinson from Dis Woman and Jack Smith for co producing. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like it, and we'll be back with another edition soon.